very happy to, to present uh, Louis Taifer, uh, my colleague in Sherbrooke. So uh, Louis needs uh, no introduction. So he has had a long and distinguished career in the field, especially of uh, heavy fermions and later on uh, uh, high temperature superconductors. Um, so he's been one of the main actors in the development of the understanding of the complex uh, phase diagram in these materials. So today, uh, we look forward to, to listening uh, to uh, the latest findings in his group. So go ahead, Louis. Okay, thank you very much, Jan. Okay, so today I'd like to, um, to mention some, our latest progress in, um, in trying to understand what I think can be considered one of the, the main, the major problems, questions in the field of quantum matter or quantum materials. It's this phase that we call the pseudo gap phase. A better name could have been uh, the dark phase of quantum <laughs> matter. It's, um, it's a mysterious phase that remains elusive, enigmatic. And so uh, in Sherbrooke, uh, several of us are, are really keenly interested in shedding light on this phase, uh, this electronic phase of matter, both experimentally and theoretically. So um, I'd like to just mention some of the developments over the last few years. So um, I'd like this talk to be really, I mean, an opportunity for anyone to ask questions. So please just interrupt at any time. Um, I think I, I'd rather that we just have discussion, clarification in any direction you wish. So, um, so don't hesitate to, to ask questions. So this, uh, the work I will mention today is, uh, you know, co is coming really from my group, from my students and postdocs. This is a picture that is a few years old. Uh, so new people have come on board and, and, and some have left, but several, five or six of the people in this photograph, you will see um, have, uh, have made major contributions. So both postdocs and, and students. Um, Here's a phase diagram. Almost any talk on cuprates would start with this phase diagram. It's temperature versus doping. So doping is the concentration of electrons one can actually adjust uh, in these materials. That's one of the fascinating things about these copper oxides. So these materials are layered, uh, layered stacks of copper oxygen planes. And depending on the, uh, on the doping P here, the whole doping P, one can take uh, these materials and sometimes literally one and the same sample from a state at P equals zero where you have an insulator. And this is a, a, not a trivial insulator. This is a, a, a MOT insulator, a made insulating by virtue of the strong repulsion between electrons. It's also an antiferromagnet. You can take that material all the way at high doping to what looks more or less like a conventional metal um, uh, with the usual Fermi liquid signatures. So we have all this physics between MOT insulator and Fermi liquid that we can tune by adjusting the concentration of, of holes. And of course, in between, uh, there's this uh, fascinating, very robust and strong superconductivity. Here, I, I, I write it as a dashed line because you'll see our efforts over the last several years has been to really study the ground state, i.e. the t equals zero state of these cuprates in the absence of superconductivity. It's interesting that the superconducting state itself is very well understood. It's a D-wave superconductor and we understand most of its properties. Uh, the big question is more, what is the nature of the underlying uh, non-superconducting so-called normal state, which is anything but normal, if you like. So, so this is what we've been trying to do. So basically, remove superconductivity with high magnetic fields and then sweep along the x-axis here as a function of doping as we go from metal to insulator, and in particular, uh, one point of focus is this intervening phase called the pseudo gap phase labeled PG here, which uh, one can detect by several different probes. 
either, either as a function of temperature, and there's a temperature T star, which is more of a crossover than an actual sharp transition, and or as a function of doping P as you cross this end point here, this critical point where the pseudo gap phase ends, which we call P star. And this looks more like a sharp transition, as you will see. There are other phases in the space diagram, a phase of charge density wave order. And I, will, I won't mention this today. So the focus is really going to be on the pseudo gap phase and this critical point P star. So if you're interested, we, uh, with my colleague Cyril Post, we wrote a, a sort of a perspective article on all this a few years ago. And I, I encourage you to go there if you want to have more information. Um, before I start with the cooperates, let me, let me step back and, and look at the sort of broader landscape of unconventional superconductors. So these are superconductors that are not, um, where the, the pairing is not is believed not to come from electron phonon interaction as, as in the usual superconductors like you know aluminium or niobium or lead. So there are four major families of these um, unconventional newer superconductors. There are organics, the iron-based superconductors, the so-called heavy fermions, and, and the cuprates. And and one the only thing I really want to, to um, bring to your attention is that they seem to all have the, a, a sort of similar phase diagram of temperature versus X, where X could be pressure or concentration. It seems that um, one suppresses an antiferromagnetic phase here uh, in, in orange here, for, for over here in blue over here, uh, by increasing X. And at the critical point where this antiferromagnetic order ends, you have a dome of superconductivity with typically with its maximum around the critical point. So this is true in the organics where TC might be one Kelvin or the iron-based superconductors where TC can be as high as 50 Kelvin. It can, it's also true in the heavy fermions where TCs are slightly lower. And, there, and this, so this raises the question of whether cuprates should be thought of as generally another, another reflection of the same type of phenomenon. Uh, but it's certainly not immediately obvious because the real phase of long range antiferromagnetic order ends here before superconductivity starts. And the critical point that one can actually identify experimentally uh, in the cuprates, which does lie inside the superconducting dome, is the critical point associated with this pseudo gap phase. And that phase is not a phase of long range magnetic order. So the question is, what is it? You know, what is that phase? And so so let's have a look. Um, something like 20 years ago, um, my, my PhD supervisor, Gil Lonserich, was one of those who really uh, uh, emphasized the connection between the quantum critical point, the quantum criticality, and the superconductivity, and also the associated normal state properties, typically uh, a resistivity that would be linear in temperature. Okay, so, so, so the paradigm, this sort of paradigm was really launched, I would say, um, with, with that paper. And so let me give you an example from another family of, of materials, the, the organics. And these are quasi 1D organic conductors. Uh, Claude Bourbonnet here in Sherbrooke is a real, is a, one of the world leading theorists on this, on this, uh, in this subject. I would say this is actually an archetype of, of the, uh, supercon superconductor derived from a magnetic quantum critical point. And, and it just, just so you, you see, the kind of, if you measure resistivity in a system like this, you do see pronounced changes in the resistivity. So the resistivity at the critical point is, has this T linear dependence, which is unconventional, unusual. Uh, if you go far away, you recover the usual Fermi liquid signature, a T squared dependence. Okay, so you go from T to T squared as you move away from the critical point. And as you go inside the phase of a magnetic order, then you have a big change which reflects a reconstruction of the Fermi circuit. So these are the three kinds of behaviors that you can see in the resistivity. Of course, there are many other properties. Okay, so let's look at the, let's go to the cuprates now and, and I'll look at 
a few signatures of, of, of this critical point. Um, before doing that, maybe, um, maybe say, well, what, what do you mean by pseudo gap? What, what's the gap aspect of this? And this is perhaps best illustrated by looking at angle resolve photo emission. So what I'm showing here is RPES data uh, taken by Johan Chang in Zurich um, on one, one of these materials. Uh, we've, the, a lot of the focus in this talk will be on this um, NDLS you can see its phase diagram over here. So it's got a storm of superconductivity and it has this pseudo gap phase ending at a critical point of 23%, 0.23. And, and this is, this is um, very much seen here in the RPS. You see, if you, if you look at uh, the, the, the spectral weight uh, as a function of energy in the so-called antinodal direction, you can see a gap. There's a gap here at, at zero uh, at zero energy um, for various dopings, you know, 12 and 15 and 20. But if you go beyond 23, the gap disappears. So this is this is a signature of the pseudo gap, so-called pseudo gap. So the, so definitely, as you cool into this phase here, this gap opens. And the question is, you know, what is it, and what are the consequences of that gap? Uh, you can study its temperature dependence. You can see that it closes as a function of temperature at 0.2, and that's the square here, which agrees very well with uh, the circles that you get from resistivity. So the, resist the way we see the pseudo gap phase in the resistivity is shown here on the right. If you sit above the critical point, so at 24%, you have this beautiful T linear resistivity, which is, could be the subject of an entire talk. In fact, you know. At the end, if there's still time, I, I might talk a little bit about that, but it's a fascinating property of, of metals, so-called strange metals, that this T linear resistivity persists to the lowest temperatures. It's called, it's now called, the subject is now called Planckian dissipation. Um, it's, a, it's a hot subject of quantum materials at the moment, but not one I will have time to cover in this talk. But if you lower the doping, then you see that the resistivity undergoes a pronounced change, okay? And the temperature at which this deviation starts, you know, around 50 Kelvin for this doping is what gives us, uh, is what gives us these circles, okay? So the transport and RPS agree very well in delineating the, the pseudo gas phase. So the first thing we wanted to do a few years ago was trying to understand well, what, what causes this increase in resistivity, you know? It looks like the system is all, almost going insulating, but what is going on exactly? So the measurements we carried out uh, were done uh, in collaboration with Cyril Post in, in Toulouse. So Toulouse has one of the few uh, high field labs where you can reach a magnetic fields of 90 Tesla. So this is a pulsed field facility. And here's the magnet that they, um, they built there to reach 90 Tesla. And so this is the data we got. And this data is, uh, is simply the Hall coefficient. So you know, in a, in a simple metal, in a simple one band metal, the, the Hall coefficient would be equal to one over NE, uh, E is the electron charge, and N is the carrier density. And the sign, would be, would tell you the sign of the carriers, whether you have, if it's negative, it's electrons, if it's positive, it's holes. So what we see from this measurement is that first of all, the, the Hall effect is positive, but it changes very dramatically as you modify the doping. So it goes from a low value at high doping to a high value at lower doping. So what we're gonna show now is, is one over this. So one over this is the Hall number or the carrier density. And so what I plot here is the Hall number versus doping now. And these four curves, if you take the value at high fields, uh, you know, around 80 Tesla, when you've eliminated superconductivity, you see that you need sort of, you know, 45 Tesla to actually kill superconductivity and, or even 60 Tesla to complete remove superconductivity, but you eventually reach that normal state. And so you can plot the normal state Hall coefficient on this, uh, on this figure on the right. And what you find by looking at the full range, you know, remember the phase diagram goes from zero to 0 
is that, sorry, is that you have a value which is equal to one plus P at high doping. And that is actually exactly what band structure calculations would predict for these, uh, for these materials. They have a one, it's a one band system. The, the, band, the, the Fermi surface contains holes and the number of holes is given by one plus P. It's the Luttinger theorem. So one plus P actually, actually works very well. This is from another measure, prior measurement. We also find that uh, in this YBCO material here. But what we see is that this plummets very rapidly to reach P. And again, this connects with earlier, earlier data at lower doping. So by, by being able to suppress superconductivity, we see how this transition happens. And it, it happens very rapidly. So this was done for one cuprate, YBCO. We then went on to do this for another cuprate, MDLSCO, where in fact it's easier because uh, TC is lower and the critical field is lower. So, so these data here as a function of temperature now uh, were taken in Nijmegen in a field of 35 Tesla. And that's enough in this case to kill superconductivity. And so again, what you see is that if you go from high doping to low doping, you have a, a, a major increase in the whole number, which when you plot it as a function of, you know, carry density versus P gives you these um, these red squares here. So YBCO is in blue and the LSU is in, in red. And this is other data by another group on another cuprate. So we're looking at three different, very different cuprates, all giving you the same, quantitatively the same value, same behavior of going from one plus P to P, okay? So that's a new signature that one needs to consider for what that phase is. The fact that P star, the value does changes, shows that you know, this, there's a material dependence to the actual value. It's 19 in YBCO, 23 in NDLSCO, and, and slightly higher in Italian. Okay, so that's the signature. Now, where, did, where, where could that come from? Well, it turns out that um, this, this, is, this behavior is exactly what you expect if you did have long range magnetic order. So let me sketch this out here. At high doping, we know very well that the Fermi surface is, consists of these, uh, of these circular, so, sort of circular, you know, um, single cylinders. So here I'm just drawing, you know, the Brillouin zone in the plane. So these should be thought of cylinders if you, if you go out of the plane and they contain one plus P carriers. So that's all well and understood. Now, when you go below P star, um, if you did have antiferromagnetic order uh, with a pi pi periodicity, which is a periodicity seen at, at low doping in group rates, this is, the, this is how the Fermi surface would get reconstructed. Basically, what, the way to think about this is that antiferromagnetic order changes the Brillouin zone from the large square imposed by the lattice to these um, dashed red lines given by the new periodicity from the magnetism. And so you reconstruct this by basically just folding the Fermi surface around the new Brillouin zone. And you get um, these electron-like pockets here and hole-like pockets here. And if you go even lower in doping, eventually all you're left with are these small nodal pockets containing P holes. So you go from one plus P to P very naturally within this kind of uh, reconstruction scenario. So, um, very soon after our experiment, experimental data, uh, James Story did the calculation for an antiferromagnetic quantum critical point. And he got these blue uh, circles from a calculation. And I'm just comparing this with our YBCO data. So you can see that it really does look like you're breaking translational symmetry as you would with long range antiferromagnetic order. But the fact is there is no long range antiferromagnetic core. So that's, that's part of the puzzle of, of this pseudo gap thing. So one, one question one might ask is, is it possible that short range antiferromagnetic correlations could produce in the transport properties something that looks, lo looks like um, uh, long range order? So that's one of the questions that's being investigated in the field at the moment. <clears throat> okay. So more recent experiments I'd like to mention um, is something called angle-dependent magnetoresistance. 
So the acronym is ADMR. And the, this is a powerful experiment that actually can map out the, the shape of the Fermi surface and also extract information about the scattering, scattering rate or the collision time. But let's focus on the Fermi surface. So this is work that was uh, done in collaboration with Brad Ramshaw and Cornell. And it was really led by Gaël Grissonnant, who was a postdoc in my group uh, at the beginning of the project and is now a postdoc with Brad and, uh, at Cornell. So these, these are the two papers that you may want to uh, look at to, to, to find out more about this work. So this is ADMR on this material and the LSCO that, that we, know, uh, we, under, we know very well. Okay, so the, the measurement, <coughs> sorry. Uh, here's a sketch of the Fermi surface. So it's a quasi 2D um, Fermi surface cylinder, some a little bit of warping like this, uh, just a single uh, cylinder. And as you change the field direction, you induce um, orbits. Electrons will perform orbits around the Fermi surface. And these orbits uh, result in a change in the resistivity as you change the angle. So what the measurement does is measure C-axis resistance. So you measure resistivity along the C-axis and you see how things change as you tilt the angle. And you can do this in two directions. You, know, you can do polar angle and azimuthal angle. And this is an example from the pioneering study by Nigel Hussey um, in a coup rate at, at very high doping. So you can see all these wiggles. So there's, there's lots of wiggles. This is the actual uh, uh, let's see, I can't even tell. I think this is the data and this is the simulation. So the idea is that you take data and you have a model for the Fermi surface and you adjust parameters, tight binding parameters to, to reproduce in detail the wiggles. And so as a result, you end up with a, a, a model for the band structure and therefore the Fermi surface. So we basically perform the same study uh, now in uh, NDLSCO across P star. Okay, so this experiment is done in the highest steady field in the world, in uh, Tallahassee, Florida. This is the forty-five Tesla hybrid magnet, and um, and here are the two dopings that I'm going to show you. Um, so we're going to look at right above P star at twenty-four percent. So this is this T linear resistivity, and right below P star. <coughs> at 21 or 22%. And this is where you see obviously a change in the Fermi surface. So, so this will shed light on uh, more detailed light on the Fermi surface transformation. Okay, so just to say we, we, under, you know, we have RPS data to compare with. So uh, without going into details, uh, we can do that comparison. So this is the data, the ADMR data at 24%. So C-axis resistance as a function of angle at fixed field 45 Tesla at a particular temperature. So what you see is that uh, you, have, you have variations. You know, it starts by going up, it peaks, it goes down, it goes to a minimum, goes to a maximum. Again. So there's a lot of structure there. And this structure is directly determined by the Fermi surface. So you just have to have a model and it, it helps that you only have one band and that you know for sure. So you have a one band model, you take a tight binding, tight binding parameters and you adjust parameters to reproduce uh, uh, the data. So this is what the simulations get out. So the fitting process gets out. Very, very good, not only qualitative, but quantitative um, uh, reproduction of the, of the data. And that therefore gives you that the Fermi surface is like this. So it turns out in this particular material, the Fermi surface is not a cylinder, is not a circle, it's not circular, it's actually quite um, diamond like. And that's because it's clo close to a Van Hove singularity at this dome. Okay, so that's for 24%. That's for above P star. And we can compare there with our best data. What the, so the tight binding parameters that come out of the ADMR fit are given here, and the RPES the tight binding parameters uh, measured by RPES are here, and you can see the agreement is, is remarkably good. So Louis, uh, I'm sorry, can I ask a question? 
Sure, of course. Yeah, it's a nice question. So is this tight binding model a non-interacting tight binding model? It is non-interacting. Uh, well, in the not in the following sense that interactions would actually uh, come mostly to, to affect. Well, I mean, it's just it's you know another way to put the question is how do the interactions affect these parameters? Right. So I would say these are effective parameters. You know, we don't know. There's no theory assumed here. You just assume a shape. In terms of parameters, you get the parameters up because, and then you compare to RPES. You know, RPES measures the real parameters as affected by interactions, right? And the, and all of these will be affected in principle by interactions, but in particular, this T, the the smaller the T, the stronger the interactions, the smaller the T, for example. So, so if you did the band structure calculation, you would find a T that would be larger than what RPES actually measures. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it, these are effective parameters. They reflect the interactions. Um, but the topology um, is, is given by this, and it's exactly what RPES found. So we're, it's clear that that's the correct for the uh, Excuse me, Louis. I just have a quick comment or question. I, I'm surprised at the size of TZ, in fact. Yeah. It's, it's so, quite larger, quite a bit larger than what I expected. That's right. That's because this is NDLSCO. And if you look at Talium 201 or, or, or YBCO, the, the, this, this value would be smaller. So this actually is an extremely good agreement with the anisotropy of the resistivity. I mean, from these, once you have these numbers, you can actually calculate anything you want. So in particular, you can calculate rho C compared to rho A, and you reproduce the correct anisotropy, which is 250 in this case. Other coup rates might have a thousand or, or more. So you're right. I mean, this this is more these you know there's more dispersion along C in this LSCO coup rate than there are in other places. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, that's good. Now let's do the comparison. You know, so uh, let's compare right and left uh, with respect to the critical point. So this is the ADMR data I just showed you. Corresponds to 24 percent, and that's the ADMR data just below P star at 21%. So this is, to me, this is really beautiful. This is, this is, before you do any fit or anything, this is just raw data, right? You take one material, it's the same material, same structure, same everything. You just slightly decrease the doping into the pseudo gap phase. You see pronounced changes in the in-plane resistivity, but boy, look at this dramatic qualitative change in the ADMR. You know, not only do you go from a, a an increase with a maximum to a decrease with a minimum, but the structure here is different than it. So very clearly the topology of the Fermi surface has changed. There's a major change in the shape of the Fermi surface. Of course, we knew that the size of the Fermi surface had to change from the, the Hall number, you know, going from one plus P to P, but this is much more detailed and direct evidence for a change in the Fermi surface. So the question is, well, what is the Fermi surface uh, inside the pseudo gap phase? And that then requires, you have to have some kind of a model. Uh, to, so you try various things to try and account for that. And, and amongst the various attempts, this is the one that was able to reproduce the data most, most faithfully. And this here is a model of nodal hole pockets of that shape that would correspond to a reconstruction by pi pi and t4-magnetic core. So it turns out that this, this naive idea of, of, of a reconstruction, pi pi reconstruction to give you whole pockets, here's, here's the picture in three, three dimensions, actually does explain the, um, the ADMR data. So this further sharpens this question of, well, you know, what actually breaks translational symmetry uh, to produce effectively a new Brewing zone like this. And when, you, when you know that there's no long range pi pi and deferral magnitude. Okay. So that's that's the that's one of the new things we've found from experimental measurements uh, of the pseudo gap. Now I want to mention another completely different experimental probe um, of the pseudo gap phase. 
and maybe I should keep track of time. Is, can someone tell me roughly how much time I, I have left? Maybe Jan or? Uh, just uh, hang on a sec. So you have about uh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. Maybe you can tell me when I have five minutes left, that would be yeah. helpful. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so back to our phase diagram. So what are, we're going to, again, we will investigate the non-superconducting ground state as we you know, go from right to left, but with a new probe. And this probe is, is the thermal Hall effect. So I've talked about the electrical Hall effect. Now we're going to look at the thermal Hall effect. And the nice thing about the thermal Hall effect is that you can use it to measure insulators. And indeed, what we'll find, and this is maybe, you know, the, the main take home message from this part of the talk is that turns out that insulators have a thermal hall effect. And several inf insulators, in fact, do show a thermal hall effect. And this is not understood theoretically. So I think just very broadly, you know, way beyond cuprates, just as in basic material science, condensed matter physics, there's a new problem, problem facing scientists, experimentalists, and theorists. And it's, it's this, how can an insulator produce a thermal Hall effect? What, what is the mechanism? So it's a fascinating subject, which started with the cooperates in our group, but has now led us in all sorts of directions, as you will see. And, and, and theory, many theorists are puzzled by this, proposing all sorts of mechanisms. But I think it's fair to say that in this new field, uh, there's just no consensus on what's going on. So I, I think that's fascinating. So, so let's look at the, the, the thermal hall effect in Cooper. So this is another uh, project that was led by Gael uh, when he was in our group. And his, his, his leading paper was published a few years ago in that. So let me take you through the, the study. So first of all, what is the thermal hall effect? Well, it's the exact analog of the elect, it's the thermal analog of the electrical hall effect. So what you do is, you know, this is your sample, you stick it on some kind of heat sink, you heat it, at the uh, at the end here, the red the red hot end here, that will send a heat current J along the x direction. You apply a magnetic field along the z direction, and you detect a temperature difference across the sample transverse to the current along the y direction. So this temperature difference delta T y is what you measure. You take it. You, you measure it relative to the delta Tx that you generate by sending the current along x. And then this gives you kappa xy. So kappa xy is a thermal hall conductivity that I'll be, I'll be plotting in the subsequent slides. Okay. So here's a study, here's our phase diagram again, a slightly different version, but basically from zero to 0.3. So let's start at the high end above P star in these, in these LSCO-based group rates, so at 24%. So on the right here, what I'm plotting is kappa xy over T versus temperature. And this is in a field that's enough to kill superconductivity. Okay, so there's no superconductivity for T in any of this, uh, in this talk today. So in red is the data. You measure the thermal Hall effect, that's what you get at 24% in this, in this metallic uh, state. If you compare with the electrical Hall effect, so the electrical Hall conductivity sigma xy, which you can measure on the same sample with the same contacts, you get the blue line when you multiply it by this universal constant L0. This is the Sommerfeld value of the Lorentz number in, in, in universal constants. Uh, what this shows you is that you satisfy what's called the wiedemann franz law, which I think you know, most of you will have seen. In, in their courses. And the wiedemann franz law basically says that heat and charge conduction in a metal have to be equal at t equals zero. And that's what we find. At low temperature, they become equal. They slightly deviate at finite temperature. That's also understood why the thermal conduction should be less than the electrical conduction. That's all understood. So basically, this data is exactly what you expect from any metal. OK, so there's no surprise, in other words. Now, what happens if you decrease the doping below P star? Okay, and this is what you see. So if you go to either 8% or 6%, for example, what you see 
is that the electrical conductivity uh, becomes very, very small. You're approaching the insulator, sorry. You're approaching the insulator. So there's no, this very, very small uh, electrical Hall effect, but you, you still have this huge uh, and negative thermal Hall coefficient. Okay, so you go from a situation where you have, ah, sorry, this is, I somehow skipped this slide. This is the slide I wanted to show you. So if you just slightly decrease, what you see is you go from a positive Hall coefficient, thermal Hall coefficient to a negative. Electrically, it remains positive, as, as I've shown previously, but thermally, it becomes negative. And this is the discovery, basically, is that there's something, there's a, a new negative thermal Hall conductivity that kicks in when you go inside the pseudo gap filaments. And you can, you, this is at this green line here, but then you can look at it at lower and lower doping. And, and what you find is that as you decrease the doping, this negative thermal Hall effect persists. So this is, this is wonderful. I, I think this, I, this is, to me, this shows, this is a great example of the excitement of experimental uh, science is that, first of all, the thermal Hall effect is a hard thing to measure because you have to measure very small temperature differences. But you know, this field is 30 years old and you find that somehow nobody measured, nobody had measured the thermal Hall effect in cuprates before at least not in the non-superconducting state. And, and when you do, you discover something completely surprising. You discover that your insulator, you know, your mod insulator at zero doping, where no charge moves, has a huge thermal Hall effect. Completely unexpected. You know, nobody would have thought that, that. Nobody had seen it, and nobody, now nobody knows why. So it's a, it's a wonderful sheer discovery that, that, that points to some very fundamental questions, okay? So, so, so Louis, can I ask a question? Uh, yes. Uh, what happens in the, with the thermal Hall effect in the superconducting phase, if you have superconductivity, is it known? Uh, yeah, actually you can study that, but um, it will depend on the relative importance of the electronic and phononic contributions. Here, I, I'm not going into those details, but for sure here, there's no, phon there's no electron, so it's, so this is actually, there's no electronic contribution here, but if you go in the superconducting state, of course, in principle, there will, well, there will be an electronic contribution. And, and people have, have, have found that in very clean crystals like YBCO, uh, the thermal Hall conductivity increases dramatically actually as you go below TC. And that's because the mean free path of electrons increases very rapidly. So this is a whole different subject, which is quite well understood, but, what we're actually finding here is that it's not the electronic part that's surprising. It's the, the neutral, the neutral heat carriers that are surprising. So maybe I won't, I, there's a, a few slides that, that, will, that, that, will, that will show you that phonons are actually responsible for this thermal Hall effect, it turns out. I'll skip those because I'd like to get to some materials slightly further down. So, uh, this is just the slides that demonstrate phonons. So, so this leads us to the question, which is goes way beyond cuprates. It's actually a very general question. What makes phonons become chiral in a magnetic field in insulators? So this word chiral is a bit, maybe a bit misleading. I'm not saying that phonons are intrinsically chiral. What, what, all we're saying really is that why do the phonons produce a thermal Hall effect? Why do they, you know, why are they skewed in one direction uh, more than in the other when you apply it? Okay. And so um, a lot of interest, there's a lot of interest in this question now. And this is one example, for example, of, of a recent study by Cameron Benya, who showed that in strontium titanate, a very, very different material, you have a very large thermal hall signal, a thermal hall conductivity, not unlike what we found in Cooper's, in fact. So this is an insulator. Why does it have a thermal Hall effect? Here, they suppose that it's, that one ingredient is the scattering off structural domains. I mean, we don't know why that would give you a, a Hall effect, but it turns out that their study points as that, as a possible mechanism. Um, my student, Marie-Ève Boulanger, investigated that me mechanism by looking at cuprates without structural domains and some with structural domains. And, she found very, very similar data uh, and, and concluded that that's not a mechanism in cuprates. So 
Let me uh, go quickly through that. Uh, in a more recent study, which I like a lot, uh, my postdoc, Lu Chen, with, working with Marie, they, we went to a completely different material, copper telluride. This is a cubic oxide insulator. It's an anti magnet. But what we found is, again, a very large thermal Hall effect, also negative in this case. And so more and more materials are now showing this, this Hall effect. And so it's, not a, it's really a question of, well, what's going on? What is the mechanism? And um, so I won't go through all the theoretical scenarios, but let me just flash through just to give you a, a feeling for, for what people are considering and who's working on this. And there's a sort of excitement you know, over the last last two years or so. So uh, Chandra Varma has a proposal in terms of a special state, but that special state only potentially occurs in cuprate, so it would not explain uh, all these other uh, materials. Um, Subir Sajdev has done a lot of work on, on this. He's, he's, he's fascinated by the phenomenon and he's looking at various possible mechanisms. And the latest thing he's working on is, is some kind of, something like a phonon condo problem where where the phonons would scatter off local moments. And so it's trying to think of, 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 of whether that could explain physics. Um, Steve Kibbelson is also, uh, is also working actively on this and looking at uh, certain kinds of resonance scattering of phonons by impurities, whether these impurities would have to be magnetic, for example. Or... So there's uh, Leon Valence is looking at just a coupling of phonons to spins and insulators. Uh, Alan McDonald has considered the phonons scattering off charge defect and so on. So there's lots of theoretical interest. And so maybe if I have five minutes, do I have five minutes? Um, yes. I would, okay. I would like to just maybe end by showing you how this connects to um, another, uh, another area uh, of uh, the, the broad field of quantum materials. And that's the area of, of spin liquids, okay? So, um, so the question that in that field that's been asked over the last two or three years by many groups and theorists is, can the thermal Hall effect detect exotic excitation? And these excitations are predicted to occur in certain spin liquid uh, systems, at least theoretically. And in, in, in the so-called Kitaev um, spin liquid, with uh, this honeycomb uh, structure, um, the, the prediction is that the excitations would be Majorana fermions or Majorana edge modes. And these are very exotic particles with certain topological properties that you know, may be potentially useful for manipulating quantum information, for example. So there's a lot of interest in trying to observe such particles. And it turns out that theoretically, it's predicted that the thermal Hall effect uh, would detect, could detect such particles. So um, one of the materials that people have been really interested in uh, is ruthenium trichloride. And this is a, an insulator. It's a 2D insulator. And, and it has a phase diagram like this, uh, where B is the magnetic field applied in the plane uh, of this 2D system. And so at low fields, it has, a, it has magnetic order. It's called zigzag anti magnetism. You can see the spins here. But if you apply a field in excess of seven Tesla, you, you remove that ordered state. And the question is, what happens then? Do you have a quantum spin liquid, QSL? Um, eventually, you have a polarized state. But this has been a great playground for studying thermal transport, as I'll show you here. So. Um, uh, my PhD student, Etienne de Francois. And, and so I've run out of time to really go into this, but this is, a, I encourage you to look at our very recent posting on archive uh, if, you're, if you're interested. But we're basically, we're asking the question by looking at data and comparing to cuprates of whether perhaps, in fact, the phonons are carrying the thermal Hall effect in this material. So this it's a very lively field. This is an exciting experimental probe and is a very open new subject, which we hope eventually will shed light on the pseudogap phase. Because going back to the original question, why is the thermal Hall effect zero outside the phonon thermal Hall effect? Is zero outside the pseudogap phase and it switches on inside the pseudogap? 
So something about the pseudogap phase is actually producing chiral phonon. So is this some kind of magnetic character? It's a, or what? You know, so, so this will be very interesting. So I think uh, I can summarize maybe with this graph and, and stop up here, just back to our phase diagram. And, and this is in a, an article I wrote recently, very short, to try to capture some of the current issues in the field. And, and I've shown you issues are, are associated with this critical point, which connects cuprates to nictides and heavy fermions and organics. And this transition from one plus P to P in the carrier density. I've shown you this thermal Hall effect, which persists down to zero doping and how that might be related to what's going on in, in spin liquids. And I didn't really talk about this, but this Plankin dissipation actually connects cuprates with systems like twisted by their graphene and, and several other materials that show this intriguing T linear residue. So let me stop here and take any more questions. I'm surprised that you will eliminate the magnons from being the thermal carriers in, in, in your superconductors. Yeah, hi, hi Arthur, very good question. In fact, at first, the re because we saw thermal Hall effect in the antiferromagnetic phase, you know, that, was a, that, was a very, that was a clear question. Could it be magnons? And in fact, there's been quite a bit of theoretical work by um, Patrick Lee and Naoto Nagaosa and these guys have really shown that under certain conditions, antiferromagnets, so magnons and antiferromagnets can give you a thermal Hall effect. The conditions, however, uh, it's sort of a theorem. There's a, they, they have what they call a no-go theorem. And the no-go theorem, basically the spins have to have uh, a, a chirality to them. So, and in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a nail state where the spins are, the, you have collinear order on a square lattice, there's, that's no go, there's no chirality in that order. So, um, so then you ask, well, maybe the, the spins are slightly canted out of the plane and so on. Basically, theoretically, you would not expect, but experimentally, the way we showed uh, quite conclusively that magnons were not responsible for the, for the thermal Hall effect is by sending heat current along the C-axis. You see, these are 2D systems, electronically and magnetically. So the magnons have high velocity in the plane, but they don't have almost zero velocity perpendicular to the plane. So we did the thermal Hall effect along C, and we found an isotropic result. So basically, <laughs> the only thing that's isotropic is, are the phonons. So that's the part I skipped quickly uh, in my talk. But Thank you. OK, Michel Cote has a question. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thank you, uh, Louis, for this exciting talk again. Um, what's the variation of the thermal conductivity uh, of the chiral thermal conductivity with respect to apply magnetic field? Okay, very good question. So it depends on the material, but the general the general thing we observe our measurements all more or less all start at 100K and then we go down in temperature. So the signals that we see, whether in cuprates or in this copper telluride or, or, or even in ruthenium trichloride, they, the signal picks up as you cool below 100K and maybe down to 50K, typically it's linear in field. So you double the field, you double kappa X1. However, when you reach the peak value where the, the thermal Hall effect tends to be maximum, this is something I didn't emphasize, but if you come, what you observe experimentally is that kappa XY has a maximum amplitude where kappa XX has a maximum amplitude. And you know where kappa XX is phonon dominated. So this already suggests you know, very strongly that kappa XY does come from phonons. And so if you sit at that peak value around 20 Kelvin, it almost always have a, have a sublinear field dependence. So where you take the strongest, you have some sublinear dependence. So you double the field and you don't double, you don't quite double the capex one. And, and just like the field is always perpendicular to X ah, and Y. So that's, that's, that's one of the most fascinating questions actually. Um, <clears throat> for those who are interested in ruthenium trichloride, um, maybe, maybe Tammy and Jan and, and others. You, there, the, the really intriguing thing is that the latest data 
from the Japanese group and other groups, is that they get a thermal hall signal by applying the field parallel to the heat current in the plane. Mm -hmm. So this is very this is very strong. <laughs> So they, they, you know the two are parallel. Naively, you would say, "Well, how can you get a Hall effect from current parallel to field?" But they do. They just reverse the field, and you reverse the dty. So you generate a transverse temperature difference, which has is anti-symmetric with respect to changing the field direction. And that actually has just recently been shown by uh, Young Bak Kim, a theorist in Toronto, it has been shown to be the result of the particular structure of ruthenium trichloride. Turns out it's allowed by symmetry because of its structure for a field along A axis, but not along B. And indeed what people find is that there's a thermal hall effect when the field is along A, but not when the field is along B. Now they explain, this is explained in terms of, of chiral magnons or Majorana fermions. The big question is whether phonons could actually do the same given this unusual structure. Uh, that's there's no answer to that at the moment. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, Louis, yes. Uh, congratulations. This is very, uh, very great stuff. And uh, of course, it makes us all feel incompetent again. And to underline that, I will ask a, uh, a very naive question because you seem to to dismiss charge carriers. But if you if you have equal amounts of electrons and holes, do you not get a, a situation where the electrical Hall effect can cancel, but you still have the, the, the heat transport by both these carriers. Is yeah. that a possibility? Oh, for sure. If you have two types of carriers, yeah. you, will, uh, you will definitely get some kind of combination of the two modulated by the mobilities typically. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but this is, this is again in a regime where you, know, you have to have electrical conduction. So you have to have a, a low enough resistivity uh, that you can call your sample metallic, right? So basically, in, in, apart from very high doping, uh, when you start to lower the doping in cuprates, but then if you go to these actual insulators that I've shown, uh, there's no electrical conduction. So you don't really need to worry about uh, uh, okay. any, any of this, really. But you do, you, I mean, if you have good electrical conduction, how you separate well, the trick we played actually is the trick I just mentioned in, in answer to Arthur's uh, question. Let's go to these, this metallic state in cuprates. Well, if you send the heat current along C, there the metallic conduct conductivity is very, very low, mm -hmm. you know, 450 mm -hmm. times smaller or a thousand times smaller. So forget it. You know? So if you see a thermal hall effect when you apply the heat along C, then you know that you've got your hands exclusively on the phone. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question? Uh, Michel again? Yes. So just to be to confirm, these uh, thermal all effects are seen in anti-ferromagnetic anti materials, except for the strontium one. Right. Is the, yeah. yeah. Which is, so exclusive, is there other example of like non-magnetic material which shows that yeah, so that, that's a good question. It's, I mean, this is, there's not, you know, there, there aren't 100 measurements of thermal hall conductivity. It's, it's so, it, it, in a sense, it's a sort of relatively new field to try to measure that in insulators. And so we don't have dozens of, of examples, but the, the list is growing. At the moment, unless, you know, unless I missed something, uh, I would say we don't have an example of a, of a non magnetic insulator that has a thermal hall effect except for strontium titanate. And strontium titanate is an unusual material. It's, it's a quantum paraelectric, very high um, right. polarizability, and it's got the structural effect. And so I don't know, yeah, you still have to explain it. But so we're basically now going to more and more um, si simpler, simpler materials. You know, at, at some level, people, you know, I give this talk, people ask, well, have you tried measuring in silicon? <laughs> You know, or something like that. Well, maybe that's what you have to do. You know, you go back to simpler and simpler and you still see it. So we're going to measure things like magnesium uh, difluoride, you know, the Kittel textbook example of an anti magnet. Uh, we did measure okay. lithium fluoride. Lithium fluoride is like, you know, sapphire. It's a very, and right. that gives you zero. So, okay. okay. So, 
that's zero, but it's not magnetic. So is manganese fluoride going to give us a non-zero signal? That's like the simplest possible example. Um, you know, there's nothing chiral about this material or exotic. So if we get a signal in magnesium, mag magnesium like fluoride, I think it's going to send a very strong indication that magnetism is, is, is at the heart of this. It may be local magnetism associated with defects that create locally a chirality to your spins. You know, your spin order is not chiral. So you should have the no-go theorems or for magnons, but you should, you know, there's no reason why phonons would have skew scattering on, on the order, but they, they could skew scatter on locally deformed magnetic environment. I mean, in my view, that's probably the promising way to go, but we'll see. Okay, thank you. Okay. One last question from uh, Maxim. Hi, thank you, Louis, for this uh, presentation. Um, can you come back to your ADMR uh, results that you've got? You're talking about this year, I think. Um, yeah, this one. Uh, what was the doping of the NDLSCO? So it was 21%. So it was near uh, the pseudo gap, yeah? Uh, the P star, yeah? It's just below. You see, uh, if I go to the actual phase diagram here, so the critical point is P star 23, and 21 mm -hmm. is just below, yes. Oh, okay. So my, my question would be, uh, is, is it possible to to do the, the same experiment at like higher uh, p to hope to see those nodal pockets on this uh, ADMR uh, experiment? You, are you saying to hope to see the anti-nodal pockets? Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. So if I go back to this, re this little cartoon that we had, let me see, where was it? I think it was over here, right? Yeah, so you're yeah. saying, so it looks like we're seeing this. Yeah. And you're asking, well, how about if we go closer to P star mm -hmm. and could we detect this? Well, yeah, yeah. In, principle, in principle one could. Um, however, one of the things that, um, you see, conductivity is dominated by regions of high velocity and low scattering. And it turns out that the antinodal region suffers both from low velocity because we're actually close to a Van Hove singularity. This is, so this is something Michel will understand immediately. Yeah. If your Van Hove singularity, you're close to it, then the velocity actually goes to zero in this region. Okay, and so that means you have the high density of states, which means you have a high scattering rate. So actually mm -hmm. this pocket, even if you could in principle see it, is likely to be invisible to, to any kind of transport because it, it just won't contribute to the conductivity. Okay, yeah, I was uh, hoping that we could have uh, enough uh, precision with this uh, experiment yeah, we, to get it, okay. First of all, we're not really sensitive to this region for two mm -hmm. reasons, low velocity and high scattering. Okay, okay. thank you, Rui. Okay, yeah. okay uh, actually, Philippe Saint-Jean also raised his hand. Uh, yes. Uh, so I have a very rapid question, just out of curiosity, uh, still coming back to, to electrons, although they are bound and they're not, they do not move even the modern slater regime. Um, you were discussing the, the influence of, of nuclear spins, I guess, with, with these magnets, uh, but is there, could there be an influence also of, of the coupling with electron spins, uh, like in the polaron type of regime where yeah. phonons interact with electron spins? Yeah. So. Um... There's one theoretical uh, proposal, you know, I, I went through very quickly, but um, this is basically a scenario that Alan, Alan McDonald has investigated. He's, he's shown that you can get skew scattering of phonons off charged impurities. And it's basically, you know, if you have, let's say, he's thinking of oxygen vacancy, for example, or yes. oxygen impurity, this will, because of the local, local electrons, will actually uh, be charged and will generate locally a Lorentz force effectively. And that will cause phonons to, um, to skew scatter and it will produce a thermal hall. So in principle, this is, I mean, you may have noticed that a lot of the materials we study here are oxides. So oxygen vacancies are uh, clear, I would say a clear uh, possibility. Uh, however, there's a few things that argue against that. And so there's two arguments for why we don't think that that's, the that's what's going on. The first is that 
This could, this could explain why it happens at zero doping in an insulator. But imagine now that you increase the doping, the system becomes more and more metallic. And this, this whole idea of a local charge may apply to an insulator, but it cannot apply to a metal because the mobile electrons will screen any local charge. Yeah. And the fact that the thermal signal basically is as large at high doping as it is at low doping sort of rules out, at least in cuprates, that particular mechanism. Uh, and, and, and even more so when you go out of the pseudo-gap phase at the, at the highest doping, suddenly the signal disappears. So but it, what, but it, does, it does scales with the, with the doping, doesn't it? Or maybe, maybe I, I, I misunderstood some of this. Yeah, it looks that way, but actually the, we think that the more, um, the more relevant way to characterize the magnitude of the thermal Hall effect is to look at the thermal Hall angle. So it's kappa xy over kappa xx. But when you plot kappa xy over kappa xx as a function of doping, it's actually constant more or less within error bars, it's constant up to p star and then it goes to zero. So it's hard to, hard to explain in that context. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Thank you. A very good question. Okay, so if there is no other questions, or let's thank uh, Louis again for a very nice talk and uh, thank you very thank much. You all for joining. Yeah. Thank you for showing up. Thank you. Merci, Louis. Merci, Jan.